Hi, I'm Peter Martinson, and I'm with you at the American Geophysical Union General Conference of 2011 in San Francisco. And with me today is Dr. Richard Altrock with the Air Force Research Laboratory. How do you do, Dr. Altrock? Hi. Now, uh, several months ago, you uh, forecasted that the current solar cycle that we're going into is going to be relatively weak and perhaps a little bit late in coming. Um, but what you're presenting now is showing somewhat a little bit, something a little bit different than that. I wonder if you could just describe what you're, what you're seeing. Okay. Uh, well, back in June, that was when the last uh, effort was made to forecast what was going on. Uh, the data that I'm using indicated that uh, solar maximum was probably going to occur in about uh, 2013 and that it would be relatively weak. Now with a few months more data, uh, I've come up with uh, a slightly different interpretation. And uh, what, what, I've, what I'm using here are data from what's called the uh, photoelectric coronal photometer which is in use at uh, Sacramento Peak Site of the National Solar Observatory at Sunspot, New Mexico. And what this instrument does is to observe uh, at a very high level of, uh, uh, at a, let me just say, at a very low noise level, the intensity of lines, uh, these are, uh, uh, lines in the solar spectrum uh, that are formed in the corona. And uh, there just happens to be uh, a uh, accident that some of these lines are visible in the solar part of the spectrum. Most of the lines that come from the solar corona are uh, at the ultraviolet or extreme ultraviolet uh, or in the x-rays because that's the temperature of the corona is in the millions of degrees, and that's where these lines are formed. But there are also uh, two lines that are formed uh, in, the, in the visible part of the spectrum. One is from 13 times ionized iron, and one is from nine times ionized iron. And the most interesting of these to me is the one that's uh, ionized 13 times because of the fact that it represents, it's formed at the uh, temperature that is most often seen in the corona. So it represents a, a temperature level on the corona that's very ubiquitous, that the, you see all over the corona. So uh, you'd say that the uh, 13 times iron, ionized iron is a good, it gives you a good image of where the corona is. Yes, and it's, it's formed at about two million degrees which is sort of an average temperature in the solar corona. Uh, and so we can get very good observations of how the corona is varying over long time scales. And uh, I started, um, and I, I sort of inherited uh, this instrument back in the early 1970s from a person who built it at that time and then left the observatory. And so I've been observing with it uh, ever since then. So. I have about 30 plus years of uh, observations of the corona. And since the solar cycle uh, lasts approximately 11 years, I've got about th a little more than three years, three solar cycles, I should say, uh, of data. And uh, what I do is to uh, plot where uh, in the latitude and longitude, uh, or latitude and time, uh, plot of the corona where activity is occurring. Mm -hmm. And what I found out was that... Uh, now th that's, a, that's, what, that's what this diagram is showing, right? That's right. So uh, this, is, this is a plot going from 1973 up to the current time. And it's averaged between the north and the south hemispheres. So this is the equator and this is the pole, but with both hemispheres averaged. So it's both hemispheres kind of mapped together. Yes. Uh -huh. And two things that uh, appear on here very clearly are one of them is what's called a rush to the poles, and I'll, I'll try to describe that a little bit more. And also this extended solar cycle, 
which uh, starts approximately uh, at this location and lasts for 18 years. And uh, this is the location of parts of the corona that are emitting in the iron 14 line. So where it's dark, that means there are a lot of emission regions in iron 14 occurring. Where it's white, very few uh, emission regions are occurring. The rest of the poles uh, was named first after uh, the observation of uh, polar crown prominences on the sun, which are clouds of gas uh, in, the, uh, in the solar atmosphere sure. that uh, hang over uh, what are called neutral lines in the magnetic field of the sun. And the ones near the poles represent a boundary between a uh, magnetic field that is occurring in the new solar, solar cycle versus magnetic field that was occurring in the old solar cycle. And it turns out that... Uh, so you say the rush of the poles is showing the, the old solar cycle and this part is showing the, the beginnings of the new solar cycle? Well, for example, on both sides of this, uh, there is new, new cycle uh, magnetic field over here and there's old cycle magnetic field over here. So it shows how the old cycle magnetic field is being destroyed. It's being pushed to the poles where it eventually disappears. And the new, new cycle asserts itself at that point. And all of the magnetic field then is from, is from the new cycle. So uh, we know that, that this uh, is a very important part of the solar cycle. Uh, that's caused by the uh, uh, solar dynamo, which drives the entire uh, solar cycle. And what we found is that if we, if we can track uh, this rush to the poles, when it reaches a latitude of about 76 degrees, which is drawn by this very thin line here, that's, that's the time that solar maximum occurs. And you, you said that that happened at all three of these yes. observations? Yes, uh, and that's also shown over here in more detail. This is a plot only going from about 50 degrees latitude up to the poles, and here are the three rush to the poles that we saw over here in this other uh, plot. And as each one of these reached about 76 degrees latitude, that's when solar maximum occurs, which is sh uh, shown down here by these these three M's. So. I'm looking for that in the current solar cycle, and about six months ago, what I saw was, I'm sorry, this is on a totally different scale now, sure. but... Uh, so this it, is just stretched out it's over several very, over yeah, fewer years. Stretched out, this only goes back to 2001, up to the current uh, time. Oh, and this, and this is the whole sun, this is the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. That's, that's correct, okay. yes, yeah. So. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, what, what I saw was this rush to the poles uh, began to become evident back in about 2006 and was proceeding in a relatively normal fashion, although very slowly. Uh, and at that time, I thought that if it proceeded at that rate, that solar maximum would occur probably in about 2013 because it was going very slowly. In 2010, and, and part of uh, when you saw that it was moving slowly, was that part of the reason why you thought it was going to be a weaker cycle too? Well, yes. Uh, in general, just that the level of activity in this cycle has been from the very beginning. It's been it's been lower than normal. So uh, that's really the basis on which I was saying it was going to be a weaker cycle. Uh, starting in 2010, there was a sudden increase in the rate at which the rush to the poles was occurring, and it, this line here, it's, although it's very hard to see, it's somewhat steeper than, than this line. So it's, it suddenly moved up to 76 degrees at the current time. So this, this whole technique that's based on 30 years of observations in the previous three solar cycles says that when this uh, rush to the poles reaches 76 degrees, that's, that's when solar maximum is, is going to occur, and that's now. 
there's a uh, uncertainty of about uh, 0.3 plus or minus 0.3 years in that. So, uh, but in any case, since we're at the end of 2011, that means that sometime in the last six months, uh, it's likely that solar maximum occurred. And that's been seen in some other uh, observations of totally different types of uh, solar parameters. Now, at what point uh, will we know for sure that we've actually reached the, the solar maximum? Well, the solar maximum is generally defined by the uh, sunspot number uh, as produced by NOAA, and they use uh, what they call a smooth sunspot number, which uh, is made up of monthly averages of the sunspot number but then smoothed over approximately a year. Uh, so it takes, it takes data from, say, six months before now and then to six months following that. So we won't know really for about another six months whether the sunspot number will agree uh, that, this is so, that we've reached solar maximum here. All I can say is that from the past three solar cycles and this solar cycle, that's what it looks like to me. Right, and then you also pointed out to me earlier the, um, that the extended solar cycle was also accelerating and reached about the maximum point. Yes. Recently also. Uh, you can see that here from, uh, here, here are the previous extended solar cycles. And here you see this one started very slowly, but then all of a sudden uh, accelerated at a very high rate and came down to almost 20 degrees, which is shown by this very fine line here. Right now it's at about 24 degrees. And so when, when the, uh, the greatest number of these uh, emission regions reaches 20 degrees, then that's the time that I would predict that solar maximum would occur. And since it's at 24 now, I would say that that should occur within the next few months. And so that's two different lines of evidence that we are at or very near solar maximum now. This is a pretty, uh, pretty exciting development, don't you think? It is for me, yes.